from the Fairmont Hotel in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering When IoT Met AI, the intelligence of things. Brought to you by Western Digital. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in downtown San Jose at the Fairmont Hotel at a little event. It's uh, When IoT Met AI, the in intelligence of things. So we hear about the internet of things all the time. This is really about the data elements behind AI and machine learning and IoT. And we're going to get into it with some of the special guests here. And we're excited to get the, the guys going to kick off this whole program shortly. This Tom Sturmer. He is the, I got to get the new title, the uh, Global Managing Director, Ecosystem and Partnerships from Accenture. Tom, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. And congrats on the, uh, on the promotion. Thank you. <laughs> so, IOT, AI, buzzwords, a lot of stuff going on, but we're really starting to see stuff begin to happen. Absolutely. I mean, there's lots of little subtle ways that we're seeing AI work its way into our lives and machine learning work our way into its life, but obviously there's a much bigger wave that's about to crest here shortly. So as you kind of look at the, the landscape from your point of view, you get to work with a lot of customers, you get to see this stuff implemented in industry. Mm -hmm. What's kind of your take on where we are? Well, I would say that we're actually uh, very early you know, there are certain spaces with very well-defined parameters where AI has been implemented successfully. You know, industrial controls at a micro level where there's a, a lot of well-known parameters that the systems need to operate in. Uh, and it's been very easy to be able to set those parameters up. There's been a lot of historical heuristic systems to, to kind of define how those work and they're really replacing them with AI. Um, so in the industrial space, there's a lot of take up and you know, we'll even talk a little bit later uh, about Siemens who's, who's really created a sort of a self managed factory who's been able to take that out from a tool level to a system level to a factory level um, to enable that to happen at those, at those broader capabilities. And, and I think that's one of the inflection points we're going to see in other areas where there's a lot more predictability in, in a lot of other IoT systems. Right, right. Um, to be able to take that kind of system level and larger scale factors of AI and enable prediction around that like supply chains, for example. Right. It's, we're really not seeing a lot of that yet, but we're seeing some of the micro pieces being injected in where the danger of it going wrong is lower because the training for those systems is very difficult. It's interesting, there's so much talk about the sensors and the edge and edge computing, and, and that's, that's interesting, but as you said, it's really much more of a system approach is what you need, and it's really kind of the economic boundaries of the logical system by which you're trying to make a decision. And we talk all the time, you're optimizing for you know, uh, one wind turbine, are you optimizing for one field that contains so many wind turbines, are you optimizing for the entire plant, or are you optimizing for a much bigger, larger system that may or may not impact what you did on that original single turbine. So systems approach is a really critical importance. It really is. And, and what we've seen is that uh, IoT investments have been, have trailed a lot of expectations as to when they were going to really jump in the enterprise. And what we're finding is that when we talk to our customers, a lot of them are saying, look, I've already got data. I've got some data. Um, let's say I'm a mining company and I've got equipment down in mines. I've got sensors around oxygen levels. I just don't get that much value from it. And, and part of the challenge is that they're looking at it from a historical data perspective. And they're saying, well, I can see the trajectory over time of what's happening inside of my mines. Um, but I haven't really been able to put in prediction. I haven't been able to sort of assess when equipment might fail. And so we're, we're seeing that <clears throat> when we're able to show them the ability to affect an eventual failure that might shut down revenue right, for, right. for a day or two when he, some significant equipment fails, we're able to get them to start making those investments and they're starting to see the value in those micro, those micro pockets. And so I think we're going to see it start to propagate itself through at a smaller scale right. and prove itself uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of work that's got to be done to stitch them together. And yeah. IoT infrastructure itself is already a pretty big right. investment as it is. I'm going to short that mine company, because we had Caterpillar on a couple of weeks ago. Um, <laughs> and you know they're driving fleets of autonomous vehicles. Right. We're talking about some of those giant mining trucks who, you know, any unscheduled downtime, the economic impact is, you know, immense, well beyond, you know, worrying about a, a driver being sick or had a fight with his wife or, you know, whatever reason is bringing down the productivity of those vehicles. So right. it's, it's actually amazing these little pockets where people are doing it. I'm curious to get your point of view too on kind of, you know, you made an interesting comment with the guys like, I'm not sure what the, the value is. Because the other kind of big topic that we see is when will the data and the intelligence around the data actually start to impact the balance sheet? Because data used to be kind of a pain, right? You had to store right. it and keep it and it cost money and you had to provision servers and storage. 
but really now in the future, the, the data that you have, the algorithms you apply to it will probably be an increasing percentage of your asset value, if not the primary part of your asset value. You think exactly. people start to figure that out? Well, they, they are. So if you look, if you step back away from IoT for a minute and you look at how AI is being applied more broadly, um, we're finding some transformational value propositions that are um, that are delivering a lot of impact to the bottom line. Uh, and it's anywhere from you know where people inside of a company interact with their customers, and being able to anticipate their next move, being able to predict, you know, g given these parameters of this customer, um, you know, what kind of even what kind of customer care agent should I put on the phone with them right. before you even pick up the phone to anticipate some of those expectations. And we're seeing a lot of value in, in things like that. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, and so when you, when you zoom it back into IoT, um, you know, some of the challenges are that the infrastructure to implement IoT is very fragmented. There's 360 some IoT platform providers out in the world. And the places where we're seeing uh, a lot of traction in using predictive analytics and, and AI for, um, for IoT is really coming in the verticals like like industrial equipment manufacturers, um, where they've kind of own the stack and right, they can right. define everything from the bottom up. Um, and what they're actually being able to do is to start to, to sell product heavy equipment by the hour, right. by the use, because they're able to get telemetry off of that product, see what's happening, be able to see when a failure is about to come, and actually sell it as a service back to a customer and be able to predictively an analyze when something fails and get spares there in time. And so those are some of the pockets where it's really far ahead because they've got a lot of vertical integration of what's happening. And I think the challenge on adoption a broader scale for companies that don't sell very expensive assets into the market is how do I, as a company, start to stitch my own assets that are from all kinds of different providers and all kinds of different companies into a single platform. And what the focus has really been in IoT lately for the past couple of years is what, what infrastructure should I place to get the data? How do I provision equipment, how do I track it, how do I manage it, how do I get the data back? Right. Um, and I think that's necessary, but completely insufficient to really get a lot of value IoT, because really all you're able to do then is get data. What do you do with it? And right. All the value is really in the data itself. Right. And so the, the alternative approach a lot of companies are taking is starting to attack some of these smaller problems. And each one of them tends to have a lot of value on its own, and so they're really deploying that way. Um, and some of them are looking for ways to let the, the battles of the platforms, you know, let's at least get from 360 down to 200 so that I can make some bets. Right. Um, and it's actually proving to be a value, but I think that is one of the obstacles we have to adoption. Now, the other thing you mentioned, interesting, before we turn on the cameras, is really thinking about, you know, AI as a way to adjust the way that we interact with the machines, right? And there's, there's two views of, you know, the, the machines taking over the world. Is it the, the beautiful view where it frees us up to do other things, or suddenly nobody has a job, right? The answer's probably somewhere in the middle. Right. But, but clearly, AI is going to change the way, and, and we're starting to see just the, barely the beginnings with Alexa and see and, and Google Home with voice interfacing and, and the way that we yes. interact with these machines, which is going to change dramatically with the power of, as you said, um, prescriptive analytics, presumptive activity, right. and, and just change that interaction from what's been a very rote, fixed, hard to change to putting, as you said, some of these lighter weight, faster to move, more agile layers on the top stack, which can still integrate with some of those core SAP systems and systems of record in a completely different way. Exactly. And you know, I actually use, I often use the metaphor of autonomous driving, and people seem to think that that's kind of way far out there. But if you look at how driving an autonomous vehicle is so much different from driving a regular car, right? You don't have to worry about it, the minutia of executing the driving process. <clears throat> you don't have to worry about throttle brake, you don't have to worry about taking a right turn on red, you don't have to worry about speeding. What you have to worry about is the, the more abstract concepts of you know, source, destination, route that I might want to take, you, know, you, may be, you can offload that as well. And so it's, it changes what the, the person interacting with the AI system is actually able to do and the level of cognitive capability that they're able to exercise. Right. Um, we're seeing similar things in, um, you know, in, in medical treatment. Uh, we're using AI to do predictive analytics around um, imagery coming off of medical equipment. Um, it's not only starting to improve diagnoses in certain scenarios, um, but it's also enabling the techs and the, the doctors involved in the scans to, to think on a more abstract level about what's, what the broader uh, medical issues are. Right. And so it's really changing 
uh, sort of the dialogue that's happening around what's going on. And I think this is a good metaphor for us to look at when we talk about societal impacts on right, AI right, as well. Right, right. Um, because there are some people who uh, embrace moving forward to those higher cognitive activities and some who resist it. Um, but I think if you look at it from a customer standpoint as well, um, no matter what business you're in, if you're a services business, if you're a product business, um, the way you interact with your employees and the way you interact with your customers um, can fundamentally be changed with AI because AI can enable the technology to bend to your intentions. Right. So similar to the call center that we talked about. Right, right. right those are subtle, subtle activities. Um, it's not just AI for voice recognition, but it's also using AI to alter what options are given to you um, and what scenarios are going to be most beneficial. And more often than not, you get it right. Right. Well, the other great thing about autonomous vehicles, I mean, it, it's such a fun topic because it's something that people can understand and they can see and they, they can right. touch in terms of, of a concept to talk about some of these higher level concepts. But the second order impacts, which most people don't even begin to think, they're like, I want to drive my car, is, you know, you don't need parking lots anymore because the cars can all park off site, just like exactly. they do at airports today at the rental car agency. You know, you don't need to build a crash cage anymore because the, the things are not going to crash that often compared to human drive. So how's the interior experience of a car change when you don't have to build basically a crash cage? Exactly. Um, I mean, there's just so many second order impacts that people don't even really begin to think about. And we see this time and time again, we saw it with kind of cloud innovation where it's not just is it cheaper to rent a server from Amazon than to buy one from somebody else, it's does the opportunity for innovation enable more of your people to make more contributions than they could before because they were too impatient to wait to order the server from the IT guy. So that's where I think too, people so underestimate kind of the big, you know, Mars Law, my favorite, you know, we, we overestimate in the short term and completely underestimate in the long term the impact yeah, of these that's things. That's the, the doubling function, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, it's hard, it's hard for people, for uh, humankind is geared towards linear thinking, right? right and right. so when something like Moore's Law continues to double every 18 months, price performance continues to increase, storage, compute, visualization, display. Networking, 5G. You know, the, the sensors and MEMS, right. Right? all of these things have gotten so much cheaper. Um, it's, it's hard for a human of any intelligence to really comprehend what happens when that doubling occurs for the next 20 years. Um, which we're now getting on the tail end of, of that fact. And, and so those manifest themselves in ways that are a little bit unpredictable. And I think that's going to be one of our most exciting challenges over the next five years is what does an enterprise look like? Right. <clears throat> what does a product look like? Um, one of the lessons that you know, I spent a lot of time in race car engineering in, in my younger days um, and actually did quants and analytics um, and what, what we learned from that point is as you learned about the data, you started to fundamentally change the architecture of the product. And uh, I think that's going to be a whole new series of activities that are going to have to happen in the marketplace. As right. People rethinking fundamentally products. Um, Uber is a great example of a company that's completely disrupted an industry. In, in, on, the, on the surface of it, it's been, it's been disrupted because of the fact that they uh, essentially disassociated the consumption from the provision of the product and didn't have to own those assets so they could grow rapidly. Right, right. <clears throat> but what they fundamentally did was to to use AI to be able to to broker when should I get more cars, where should the cars go, and because they're you know they're also we're on the forefront of being able to drive this whole notion of consumption of cars, and, and getting people's con conceptual mindset shifted to having to own a car to well I know an Uber is going to be there it's, it becomes like a power outlet right, right. I can just rely on it, and now people are actually starting to double you know, double think about, should I even own a car? Right, right. <clears throat> whole different, whole different impact of the autonomous vehicles. And, and if I do own a car, why should it be sitting in the driveway when I'm not driving it, right? Send it out to go, exactly. to go work for me, make it a performing asset. Well, you know, great conversation. You guys, Accenture's in a great spot. You're always at the cutting edge. I used to tease the guy I used to work with at Accenture, you know, we had, you know, you guys squeezed out all the fat in, in the supply chain in, in, the, uh, <laughs> in the ERP days. And again, a lot of these things are people changing the lens and seeing fat and inefficiency and then attacking it in a different way, whether it's Uber, Airbnb with empty rooms in people's houses. Um, we had Paul Doherty on at the GE Industrial Internet launch a few years back. Um, so you guys are in a great position because you get to sit right at the forefront and help these people make those digital oh, transformations. That. And I'll tell you, I mean, supply chains is another one of those high-level systems opportunities for AI. We're being able to optimize 
you know, think about a completely automated distribution chain from factory all the way to the drone landing at your front doorstep as right. a consumer. Yeah. Um, that's a whole other level of efficiency yeah. that we can't even contemplate Don't right Don't bet now. against Bezos, that's what I always say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tom Sturmer, thanks for spending a few minutes and, uh, and good luck with the keynote. I appreciate it, Jeff. All right, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We are at the Intelligence of Things where IoT met AI. You're watching theCUBE, thanks for watching.